So I'm delighted to be seated besides you, Mrs. Sisi Masiwa. And um, I have so many questions to ask you. And we would take this for, we'll have a chat for 25 minutes. And I'm, I know the audience is bursting to ask questions as I am too. So we'll throw questions to the audience for 15 minutes. And after that, that's the end. <laughs> so uh, I'll go straight to the questions. Um, I can tell that uh, I, I can, it's, it's common knowledge that High Life Foundation is impacting the lives of over 1.2 million African youths. That's very impressive. And you know, it's, it's also common knowledge that you started giving before you started Econet Wireless. Can you share with us your giving story? What drove you to give? Why were you giving? And what has been your experience so far? Thank you so much. First, I want to honor the, our Minister of Youth Empowerment and also uh, thank you to CMU for inviting me to this uh, wonderful evening. And I know that many of you, you had options, you had choices tonight to go somewhere and to do something, but you made a choice to be here tonight, so it's a real honor and privilege. Thank you for coming. So the way the giving started was um, my husband was an entrepreneur and I was a professional working and one day he came home and he said to me, you know, I've come across an interesting te technology where people don't have to use fixed lines anymore. You can actually use something called a cell phone. So I think uh, with all the challenges that I have, now, when he started his business, he was in construction and uh, electrical engineering. So his main customer was the government. And you know, uh, generally, uh, governments, because of, of, of uh, uh, budgetary constraints, and uh, sometimes there's, uh, there's generally never a surplus. There's normally a deficit. Maybe Rwanda is an exception. Uh, so it affected, it always affected his cash flows. And he said he needed to consider, look at a business in which he, he could transact directly with the customer. So this new technology was a real opportunity for him. So uh, he went to Germany to look and find out what was happening. And I remember the only country on the continent of Africa that had the technology was DRC. And uh, a wonderful, exceptional entrepreneur, he since passed away, called uh, Mr. Watiera, was the one who had uh, invested in this uh, business. So um, he applied to the government for a license, and the, the government said no, because uh, there was so little knowledge on the technology and its impact on how uh, you handle private and sensitive information uh, through a, a pi privately owned network. So when the government said, no, you cannot have a license to operate a, a, a mobile telephone business, he then decided to go to court and he sued the government. I couldn't believe it when he decided to do that because I said, you know, uh, something, I would never sue the government. But at least now that you've done that, I have faith, I believe in, in somebody, I believe in God, you don't even believe. What's the basis of your faith, your strength, whatever? And he said to me, you know what, it's not gonna take that long, you know, the government will, will fight a little bit, within three, four months, everything will be done, I'll have my license. I did to believe him. It didn't work out like that. It took us five years, but in the process, we lost everything. Uh, it was a really, uh, to this day, it's the most intense and the most difficult uh, period of my life because, uh, you know, I was a newly married mom. Uh, newly married, we had a, a, a child and I had my own ambitions. I had, my, I had a, a nice job and I had dreams of working in, in fact, I was working in a, a project that was funded by the UNDP. Empretech. I worked with entrepreneurs and my dream was, well, maybe one day I'll be, you know, in New York doing something really big. And now that this wonderful husband of mine has sued the government, <laughs> how far is this dream going to be? So it was very difficult. Um, 
because of what we had done, the government took the the message that they kind of like uh, took from that was, how dare you? You do something like that. So since they were customer, they just said, well, since you don't think much of us, you lose the contracts you have. So we all the contracts we had, we lost. Uh, we ended up owing a lot of money. We sold the business for zero dollars. We didn't make any money out of it. Uh, but in the process, uh, it was also very difficult for him because he hadn't really anticipated what the the impact and effects of his decision. Uh, and upon reflection, um, I think it really hit him home when the first time he went to court, and the ju and he lost the the court case, and and realized that this was a real. It was going to be an uphill battle. This was a real fight, and then also realization that both of us were not really prepared for what we were about to go into. So for me, I turned to my faith. I just 100% immersed myself reading the word and focusing on building a relationship with God that would help me as a young uh, married woman, a young mom, and a profession to understand what I was going through and to literally live uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, our first track, in the process, he found his uh, faith. He also became a believer, as I was. But in the process, we began to ask ourselves, if this business becomes a reality, uh, you can only sleep in one bed, drive one car. So are we going through all this so that we may have money? Is this about money? So those questions were very uh, deep and meaningful to us. But the answer we received was, um, it was very clear. Uh, for those of you who are Christians, I can't assume everybody is, or we, people have different faiths. But for us, the Bible was the source of, 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 uh, of, of understanding the journey we were on. So I read the scripture, and, uh, and I, when I read it, I suddenly understood what the whole journey was about. I understood that I had to look more long term, that if you have money and you have one, you know, you only need one bed, one car, one of whatever. If you make money, surely, if you look around the problems that you are facing, are you not supposed to be part of the solution? So during the period, this was in the early 90s, between 1992 and 1997. During that period, maybe many of you had not even been born. Uh, the, I, that was the period from around 1988, HIV and AIDS just became s such a, a real crisis. Number one, people were getting sick, didn't know they were, didn't talk about it because it was sexually transmitted. Uh, you became uh, 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 ostracized. It was a really difficult period. And I saw my cousins, one family, nine members died one by one. We lived to bury our staff employees. And you know, construction workers move from place to place and normally the men leave their families and, uh, and you can imagine the rate of infection in the industry because of the nature of the work and, and, and so forth and so on. So that also, during that period, got us to question and to see, to, to ask ourselves, so what can we do about it? And we both, uh, and quite independently, felt education was the best way in which we could uh, weigh in with our help, especially targeted at the orphans. So that's how the giving started. We did. We started uh, with 12 orphans with no money. We didn't have money. We didn't have resources. We didn't have a, a, a plan. We didn't have a strategy. But what we just had was a strong conviction that this is something we had to do, that one day when the money does come, we actually, you know, let me be honest, I never dreamt I would be where I am and have what I have. We thought the network would probably have 100,000 customers at most, and I would live happily ever after in Zimbabwe, and, and maybe assist, if I did 1,000 uh, children, uh, that was, you know, sufficient, uh, you know, more than uh, beyond expectation. But look where we are today. Thank you so much for that. <laughs> if, uh, I, please, can you give her a round of applause again? <laughs> that, was, that was very inspiring and touching.
Uh, so what I what I got from that was be convicted, become be, have a strong conviction to be part of the solution. And even though you started with nothing, but you you had that conviction that you would change change the world and change your community. So thank you very much for that answer. Um, the next question is. From what you said, you, you didn't expect to be where you are like right now. Currently, you're living a life that's different from the communities you serve. How do you identify with their, their, their expectations, their troubles, and their realities? How do you do it? I think uh, it's, it's so easy when you begin to become comfortable and move away from the communities that you normally uh, we're familiar with, it's very easy to, to forget. I have to be honest with you. Uh, what has kept me connected to the communities is um, uh, I have people around me who remind me of where I came from. And also personally, it's very important for me to remind myself and remind my children that uh, it wasn't always this way. Uh, and also to understand when we went through that journey, we didn't overcome because we were strong and because we were uh, stronger than anybody else or cleverer than anybody else. We overcame because there were so many people, who, ordinary people who believed in what we were doing. When I wanted to look for a place of peace and a place of encouragement, it was at orphanages, nobody knew who I was. We were always in the newspaper every day in Zimbabwe. Every day, not nice stories negative and, and, and being reminded, you know, that you, they will never get the license, it's not going to happen. So, uh, and because it was a small community, everybody knew, knew what was happening. It was, they all knew we were broke, we had nothing. Someone's were ca always coming, you know, to, uh, to the house. So our lives were just an open book for everybody. So going to people who didn't know who I was, who didn't care for who I was, and who just enjoyed seeing me be with them, uh, I guess really connected me to uh, distressed communities. So as we've gone through our journey, it's the, I've, what I've tried to do is to encourage my own uh, staff and partners and those that I, I, I work with, because the work we do cannot be done by one person. Uh, it cannot be done by, uh, uh, simply because you have resources doesn't mean you know, money can do everything. You need to have people who buy into the vision, who understand what it is that really connects you to the commun communities we serve. So my ethos is we, we go where the people are, we uh, eat what they eat, we sleep where they sleep, and so that we sit with them, we hear their stories, and through that we help them to be able to achieve their God-given dreams or their purpose. So uh, when I visit communities, I, I try as much as I can to go and sleep. If it's in an orphanage, I'll go spend the night with the kids. How do you understand what they're going through if you're living in London and trying to solve the problem? I think that's one of the challenges that uh, donor communities have had and some of the, the, the real pressure that there is that uh, uh, your methods are not sustainable because it doesn't look like you live, you give a solution that is long lasting because you're disconnected from the people you're trying to, to, to help. So they, they, for me, that going into those communities is very important. You also realize most of the time people don't even know who you are. They, you arrive at the community and you say, oh, this is Mrs. Masiwa, wife of Econet, what? The kids don't really know and they don't really care. What they're concerned about is the immediate needs they have, the immediate challenges they are facing, the loneliness they face because they are living away from communi communities or the poor nutrition or just the lack of anything motivating in a lot of our communities that are distressed. So also by going to sleep uh, in those communities, you actually get to understand, oh, is this how they sleep? Is this how they wake up? Is this what happens to the to two-year-olds and to five-year-olds or 10-year-olds? They go in the garden at nine o'clock in the morning. Uh, two-year-olds are wandering around doing not having eaten, fed nothing for three, four hours before anybody gives them something to eat. So a lot of the interventions we have used as a result of the work that we do is because we went into the field, slept there, listened, observed, and were able to really come up with solutions that are meaningful and sustainable. 
Thank you so much for that. Um, so, so from what you've said, um, it's 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 obvious that giving is part of you, and I think it's also not strange to we Africans. We love to give. We love to give to our families and our communities. However, how do you think we can be more deliberate and strategic in our giving, in such a way that the the impact is felt in not just in our immediate communities but beyond our immediate communities? How do you think we can go about that? Uh, you know, it's true that we have a, a natural nature of giving. Uh, but what I find is uh, in, in some communities, it's more you give to somebody you know or your family. But to give to somebody you don't know and who has no capacity to give you back anything, that's, that's uh, uh, slightly different. And then also further, where you are now looking at... Uh, uh, you know, we are first generation wealth, right? In, in, in my family. On my husband's side, his grandfather was a, was a businessman so, and his mother was an entrepreneur. So he grew up uh, with, uh, with, in a family of means. My parents were just professionals. But we gave just to those whom we knew and because you wanted everybody to be able to go to school and not have to be dependent on uh, other members of the family. But as I grew older and found myself in the position that I was in, it was really about, are you willing, willing to share your wealth and in a more long-term manner? Because that's, then that uh, uh, is a different type of giving. And also where uh, family is looking at sharing the wealth. And then I have six children, six wonderful children. But where generally we think, no, it's the children that inherit so if you are thinking of giving, give as little as you can so that you leave the big chunk for the kids. So the, the kind of, when we get to philanthropy, where you are looking at more uh, larger resources and tackling uh, more, uh, um, I think, uh, uh, deeper problems of poverty, the attitude has, you have to literally ask yourself, are you in this for the long term, uh, or are you, do you want to just do charity, which you know you can give or you may not give? So, um, in terms of, of uh, the, the 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 then the when the mindset is long term, then it follows that you are more strategic in how you then do the giving. I believe because uh, there are many more people who are uh, getting into wealth, whether it's because of very good jobs they have, uh, because many of you are going to be in very senior positions, you're going to be managing a lot of resources, you yourselves will also have resources. Some of you will be successful entrepreneurs, you'll build companies, you'll build businesses. And when you get to the place where it has to be a strategic giving, what has to inform you is, the, for me it's primarily the long-term view coupled with your values. If you've got strong values and, uh, and are really looking to do some um, uh, heavy lifting work with your giving, then the strategy is very important. Uh, yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so long term, think long term. That's the, that's the key word, key phrase in what you said. So the theme for today is servant leadership. And servant leader, a servant leader is essentially someone who's willing to serve. And from all you've said, we can tell that you are willing to serve. You're willing to go into the fields. You're willing to see what people are experiencing, live their lives and see how things are. So in your opinion, what's your own definition of servant leadership? And you know, you mentioned that a lot of people here are going to be successful in the future. They're going to go forward and build companies. How do you think we can empower the youth to become servant leaders in the future? Yes. I have to be conscious I'm a guest of CMU, a world-renowned <laughs> university. Okay? So there's lots of research done on servant leadership and, uh, and exceptional definitions that are based on research and, uh, and good analysis. So uh, that, so I'm not talking about that kind of a definition. I have to qualify myself. I think when it comes to serving leadership, you have to define it for, you, for yourself. 
you need, yes, to read the academic side of what uh, the, uh, um, the theories of servant leadership, because there are many books that have been writ written around the area. But I think you have to, out of that, you have to find your own unique definition to what it means to serve somebody. Because companies will to tell you we are in the business of serving our customers. They are servants, right? Some customer is king, the old uh, statement, I don't know what the new way of saying customer is, is king is. Uh, but all those are different as aspects in which service is given. But for me, it, it has very much been defined by the Bible. It's who do I follow and who do I ad admire? Uh, there are many wonderful people that uh, have done exceptional things, that have done, uh, uh, I mean, that, that have really transformed communities, whether through their giving or through technology or through inventions. All that for me is service. Yeah? It is service. The, there is no way you can be uh, spending five, ten years trying to figure out how a light bulb works in order to allow, to be able to produce a product that will enable electricity to be affordable to everybody because light bulbs are affordable and not have the mindset of a servant and servant leadership. A ma ma majority of the inventions we have, the inventors never really made any money. It's only these days that you know the, we hear more and more of, of inventors who actually end up uh, reaping large rewards, financial rewards for what they invent. So I see all those things as servant leadership. Anything that has served, served mankind to solve a problem, whether it be a technology, it be a, 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 a new way in, of, of doing something, a new uh, invention, whatever it is, it's, there is servanthood embedded in that. Then on a personal level, it is, uh, it is driven personally by love. It's where you, you have to love your neighbor as yourself. For me, that is personally, for me, true servanthood. Why? We live in a world that is so divided on the basis of race, on basis of religion, on uh, sexual orientation. And sometimes when we, we interpret what it means to us and, and our values and what have you, it, we can make our neighbor look so ugly because they are different from us. So what I found in defining servant leadership, I say it has to be driven by love. Love of who? Of anybody. Whoever your neighbor is. Irrespective of how different they are from you. Because when you do that, then you are able to really reach out to anybody and bring a change. I think what has been very sad uh, uh, is, is a misunderstanding of uh, uh, things that uh, or, or um, Sometimes um, when we judge people on the basis of things that make us uncomfortable or things that make us um, uh, that, uh, afraid because of maybe you have not interacted with the person before or you don't understand their culture, etc., etc., etc. I think being in a country like this one, Rwanda, I think is evidence of just when you say the dark side of when your neighbor becomes what you is driven by hate. And then the flip side of out of that tragedy, when a neighbor is now redefined as anybody and where forgiveness undergirds the nature in which the relationship is defined, I think that for me are principles of servant leadership. Thank you very much. So from all I was hearing, you kept speaking about values, like specific value systems, you know, love, love your neighbor, long term, you know, religion, Bible, you know, things like that. So this ties directly into the next question. You know, successful people have been known to have values that they hold there to them. They have a value system, you know. What are the, the key values you feel have, have contributed to your your success as a philanthropist? And you also mentioned you have six wonderful children. You know, what, what values do you out of those ones, what values do you make sure that you instill in them? Okay, so um, I'm going to talk about, just be very honest about things that I, I do and I believe in. I believe in transparency. That don't try to look perfect. Uh, I, I must not try to prove anything to anybody. Uh, to be very comfortable in your own skin. 
I think that is important as an individual and as a woman. I think many times uh, uh, the things, the, the journey that I've walked, uh, I think th those values have really helped me to be very transparent and to be very honest with myself uh, because of the fears I've had in the process. Let me tell you, it wasn't a walk in the park to do philanthropy. Uh, sometimes, you know, leadership in a company will think, ah, uh, she has nothing better to do, she's bored. So that's why she thinks it's a good idea to be going and, you know, giving money to the poor. Sometimes people think like that, that is because you have nothing else to do. And then also as a woman, um, I'm in my 50s, right? When I was, uh, uh, when we started the, our work, uh, I felt, I said to my husband, I think I, it would, I would be more effective if I have a board seat. Because if I am trying to do what I'm doing through you, and you become my mediator, it will be the wife of is trying to do ABC. It will make it very difficult. But uh, that one I, I, I didn't win, I have to be honest. So I, you know, but what I found is the, the importance of humility, that if you've got something that you need to achieve and uh, uh, you are open, you are a person of integrity, but clothed in humility, you can reach out to people who can buy into your vision and be willing to go along with the things that you really think are important, uh, uh, especially when you are a, a woman. It's a lot harder. Many times we're not taken seriously. So some, some of these values are very important. Sometimes, you know, uh, we, our ideas are uh, considered, well, it's just nice, cute ideas, but not the kind of ideas that are worthy putting on an agenda in a board meeting. So the importance of, 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 of um, openness, integrity, be comfortable in your own skin to walk that journey is important. And then with my kids also be very, very transparent. I, I just remind them, don't try to behave like the children off or what you see on social media as this is, this is the handbag you must carry, these are the shoes you must have, this is the, the flight you must be on, these are the earrings you wear. I just tell my kids, you know what, if you put yourself under that kind of pressure, you will not get anywhere. What you need to do is to understand, number one, the money is not yours, it's mine. And Papa's. Yeah. <laughs> that I'm under no obligation. There's no way I'm, I, I, I'm obliged by law to, to treat you as if it was yours. So settling that and reminding each other that you, you also you have to study, you have to work hard. When challenges come, you know, you also have to be tough. You have to be, to be strong. You have to, to be humble. That for me, it, it, being real to the children has been very important. And also honest, that is, you know, you can have money and also to be, to grow a business, you need to borrow money. I, I remind them, hey, you have to look at the balance sheet. Don't behave like, don't believe too much what you read from Forbes. <laughs> <laughs> Because if somebody says you're worth $2, oh, they say you're worth $2, but they're not analyzing the balance sheet with respect to what they say you're worth. So it's constantly uh, you know, discussing those things and not trying to impose myself on my children. I'm not trying to make to raise little titties and little strives. <laughs> they have to be Joanna Moses, Esther, Sarah, Tanya, Vimbai. Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much for that. Um, transparency, humility, hard work, and um, just be tough, mm -hmm. essentially. That's what you said, and I think those are watchwords to live by. So we are, we are kind of out of time, but I have one question to ask you. And why, why education? Why is it the heart of your philanthropic work in Africa? Why, why education, of all things? Okay, so uh, first of all, I want to also qualify. We don't just do education, but the bulk of what we do and what is known publicly is education. Yeah. But the reason why we chose education is that uh, an educated person is most unlikely to find themselves in a vulnerable, economically vulnerable and distressed situation. 
even if you have unemployment of 95% in Zimbabwe, where I come from, it's, it's 95%, uh, it's 5% employment in the formal sector. But there's no graduate who's starving, who's waking up confused and has no capacity to earn anything. So when you educate an, a, a, a girl, you educate a boy, you really give them that uh, ability to be able to, to fend for themselves despite the hardships, uh, you know, economic or social hardships they, they may have. Education empowers, just like knowledge gives you power. Education gives you confidence. Education gives you better choices. So um, uh, if you're thinking of philanthropy, are you convinced that education is the way to go? <laughs> I think, yeah. So I think, yeah, there's a, a return on everything you do to, 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 a, to a human being. But I think the highest return you can get is education. Okay. Thank you so much. Um, so at this point, ladies and gentlemen, um, I throw the questions to you. And feel free to ask uh, Mrs. Pasiwa any question that you want to ask. So if you have any questions, please uh, indicate by a show of hands, and the mic will be brought to you. On the CSR uh, uh, issue on, you know, uh, issues of abuse or just um, maybe lack of integrity, I think, you know what, at the end of the day, uh, you find it in business, you find it anywhere. Uh, you will always find uh, in situations where, especially where the giving is based on tax incentives. I find if that it's driven by that, or uh, tax incentives, tax benefits, and incentives that are not related to impact on the people, but more to do uh, with uh, uh, business or uh, benefits, that's where there's more room for, for, uh, for abuse. Uh, but if philanthropy or CSR or um, whatever you call it is very much driven by a, a, a vision and personal conviction, the chances of abuse are minimized. Um, I always say if you want to really see true philanthropists uh, tested, go to places where they work and they are absolutely, there's absolutely no support given by in, in any form including incentives by a government. Because if, you're, if you see them doing the work uh, and the investments they make in communities, then you know that they're doing it because of their, their hearts are in what they're doing. Uh, then the issue of peers, how to promote uh, philanthropy among peers. Um, part of what I do as chair of Africa Philanthropy Forum is to use it as a platform to talk about philanthropy. Many people want to give, but they don't know how. And also, if you want to be strategic in your giving, most of the time you need institutional structures put in place to be able to do that. You need to hire qualified staff who are able to articulate your vision clearly and uh, are able to identify strategies that work. And of course, with uh, strategic giving, they, there's always, in, in some cases, there's a need for evidence-based models that you apply in, 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 in uh, tackling and uh, solving social problems. So um, all those things we have to teach one another. So many people I come across want to, uh, to get started, want to, to give, but sometimes are intimidated, but they're talking to somebody like me who's been doing this for 20 years or 20 plus years, and they're just starting. So the key thing is, you know, forming uh, organizations, networks like uh, APF helps people to understand you can start anywhere. You don't have to have uh, to be strategic from day one. You can give, start by giving to charity, do what you're comfortable. But what's important is to keep challenging yourself until you get to a place where you can do it in a more formal way, where you, you, you are you know, more comfortable with hiring the right people with the right skills 
to help you with impact measurements, uh, uh, issues of sustainability, you know, what are some of the structures you put in place, endowments or investments you can make uh, in order to, to build a, 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 a models that are financially sustainable. And which goes into the next issue of uh, sustainability. I think uh, many of the times we tend to confine sustainability to financial sustainability. So in, in philanthropy, sustainability can finance is only one off. Uh, you, uh, you, because sustainability, we married very much to impact. So you ask yourself if, if giving scholarships gives the kind of impact that we have seen in, in Zimbabwe, for instance. Uh, so we have a program where we identify your uh, uh, academically gifted students and we give them scholarships to finish two years of high school or going to university. Through that, we've been able to send it, uh, more than um, 300 students to some of the top universities in the US. Now, are those, uh, and many have graduated, they've gone on to, to do some work in the company in Econet, some are in higher life, others are working in Facebook, we have people working all over the world and in different companies. Now, financial sustainability, are they sending money to us? No. But uh, if you look at these are kids who would never, never have done what they did. There was no second option. If we hadn't intervened, identified, and given them the platform, the resources, the training, plus locking them into those universities, they would not be doing what they're doing. So uh, when I look at sustainability, in cases like that, finance takes a more secondary role and the primary role is impact. Uh, and then also, there's nothing wrong with um, doing your philanthropy in short term. Do it over five years and stop. There's no, you know, I personally, okay, I say to my, we don't necessarily agree with my husband on this one. I said, I, why would you want to, for the kids to inherit liquid, econet, ba ba ba? It's a burden to the children. I think, you know, rather give them, allow them to do things that they're comfortable with, that we have prepared them for life to do. So some people, are like I belong to some networks where some people have actually sold off their businesses, divided the money into what the kids need in order to be uh, 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 comfortable. And then the rest, they find uh, other third parties to give the money to that they think they can use the money better than they can, or they give to you know the universities or whatever structures. So there isn't, we don't have to be financially, sustainability doesn't have to be you know, uh, what if you, you know, you're not able to get the money that you receive, what will you do? Well, you stop doing what you're doing. But generally, you need to also look at the impact and be able to plan ahead that if you're, like, in, in education, uh, uh, f w when you're doing it on a bigger scale, there is room sometimes to be able to set aside resources to ensure that if you were to not have the money available, what are the things that you can do in order to give a soft landing to and, and, and minimize the negative impact of what you're doing. If it's something that is very small, the impact is also smaller, you find other people who can take over some of the work that you're doing. So I, I believe in financial sustainability, but it's not primary. What I believe is, is impact. Uh, then uh, name change, higher life. Uh, so, we were, so we were four trusts. One was called Christian uh, uh, CCPT, another one was called Capenam, another one was called National Healthcare Trust, and another one, what was the fourth one called? Sorry? Joshua Nkomo Scholarships. So when we, we did a big evaluation of have we been successful? Did we define success before? And if yes, were we successful? If not, what should we have done that we, we didn't do? And one of the uh, uh, things that was very evident was because of the way we had to register the different organizations, if when, when we started the scholarships, the type of, of structure we went for was really narrowed what we could do. We could only do scholarships and education. When we then went into health, 
we're told now you have to open another trust that only focuses on health. Then when we did the uh, working with, we one of the things we did when Zimbabwe was in hyperinflation was to start CCPT, where we tried to encourage pastors to stay in their communities so that you, uh, because many parents were leaving the country, leaving their children, and the, the social um, fabric of society was just really, you know, uh, under a lot of pressure. So we encouraged pastors to stay in their communities and by giving them salaries so that they could at least be the go-to people for uh, some of these families that were adversely affected. So we set up a different, it did, and that work didn't fit into any of the trusts, so we set up a, a different trust. So eventually, uh, we, when we re revisited our uh, vision, our mission, our strategies, what, and what have you, we said, you know what? it's better to just consolidate. Let's establish one trust and be very focused at what we do and what we do very well. And that's how we ended up uh, uh, changing the name. And of course, with uh, I like names. Every name has meaning for me. The higher life is not, it, you know, for me means just a, a better, more transcendent life, you know, as opposed to the, the other, <laughs> the other life, yeah? Then the question on uh, how do I balance between being married children, uh, I think you know it's a fallacy that you can balance your life. It's not true. That I'm being honest, it's not true. Uh, if I, uh, when I got married, uh, I, I also put uh, pressure on my husband that, hey, we must have dinner at the table as a family. Why don't you get home by six o'clock? Well, you want the guy to be able to live his dream and his <laughs> whatever, and he comes home at six and has dinner with you, you're joking, it's not gonna happen. <laughs> he comes home at midnight and you must just be happy. Uh, uh, you know, he comes when he needs to. Same with the lady. She also has her dreams, her vision, her mission, and what have you. But you have six children, so what do you do? There, there's something has to give. You never, I, I don't know if any of you saw my tweet that got me into terrible trouble <laughs> with my Zimbabwean friends. You won't, I just think I can't afford to watch Manchester United play Chelsea every Saturday. It's impossible. And then have another discussion on how the game went. <laughs> what a waste of time. So what do I do? Well, it's at least a few people are clapping. <laughs> I think I, you know, my point is the stress, the, the challenge we have on the continent, 31% to 38, in Rwanda it's 38% of the children are stunted. A stunted child can never learn, forget high school, forget university, because their brain has been already adversely affected. Most of our rural kids spent the first three years of their lives on their mommy's back. There's no stimulation of, of the mind, of the body. So when people say, oh, African kids are so quiet, they can sit for five hours and, you know, quiet and not cry. No, it's because they've been, you know, there's a lot of that has been destroyed when they're on the mother's back. Now, the mother has no choice because she has to be in the field working. So, you know, how do you manage that? So it's... It's, uh, uh, so it's those issues that for me then define what are the priorities in my lives, in my, in my life. And then selling the vision to the family. So my husband had to sell the vision to me and I sell my vision to him and selling the vision to the, to, to, to the children as well. Do we have complaints? Of course. The children will come and complain that you, you, oh, so you think your higher life work is more important than my birthday. Why did you not, you know, uh, come to my birthday and what have you? But you think to yourself, come on, you're 18. I've been doing birthdays every year. Uh, that's boring. Every single year you must see me physically to celebrate your birthday. Uh-uh. But I always try to find special moments for my kids one by one. I do. So because I've go I don't really, to be honest, I, movies, to get me to watch a movie, even Wakanda I have not watched. <laughs> It's just, I just think if I get into the movies to watch, I'm gonna take a nap so I can rest. So if I'm going to watch Wakanda, it's probably over, I don't know, two weeks, we, I, I watch a little bit. I love basketball, I love Golden State Warriors, but guess what? 
Yeah, we're winning. Uh, but what do I do? If I want a game, I'll download once in a while and then watch it over a, a number of days or, you know. But there's no way I'm going to put, to put in continuous. Or going to the gym and watch one segment where they really whacked uh, uh, Cavaliers. So if they did it in the third quarter, that's the only thing I'm gonna watch in the gym. So you have to be very clever, but at the end of the day, you know, you, you need to, you know, there's compromising. It's, sometimes it's not, it's not smooth. Sometimes you, uh, you have tears, she, she has tears, he has tears, uh, raising of voices. All those things are very normal, very, very normal. But what I love is we are all living our dream. I'm living my dream, he's living his, his dream. Thank you, thank you so much for those answers. Um, we'll have two last questions. I think, yeah. <laughs> so we'll make that three, let's make it three questions. I think there's a, there's a lady over here. So we said that we are raising two million leaders by 2020 and uh, leaders have been raised all the time and so, you know, uh, what is the link I think, uh, first of all, uh, when we came up, when we revisited our vision, mission, our strategy, what we identified was the gap in leadership. What do I mean by that? We asked ourselves, if you count the number of kids, of the number of kids we have uh, uh, invested in, how many can we say are uh, occupying key positions in government, in the public sector, private sector, uh, social sector, how many are leading movements, how many are important voices, and I must be honest that the numbers were not that great. Okay, the bulk of our giving was more to, uh, uh, to really your rural kids, uh, many of whom uh, were Able. If we hadn't intervened, they would have lasted maybe two years of, of primary school because we did, they went up to seven years uh, of primary school. Some went into uh, uh, high school, uh, up to two years of high school, four years. So when we looked at the numbers, uh, it was pretty clear that uh, what we thought would happen did not happen. And also that it, we also realized it's, you can't passively raise leaders. You have to be strategic in how you raise your leaders. So the, uh, the two million by 2020, you'll see that will soon be gone. Why? We've spent, a, we spent a substantial part of 2017 walking through uh, the issues of leadership because there is a, a, a leadership uh, gap in any country. It's not an African crisis, it's anywhere, okay. But when we looked at our own country, Zimbabwe, starting with Zimbabwe, what we found was uh, we, uh, that although there were some really uh, telling gaps, but we, there were also opportunities of doing something that is pretty special. So uh, now remember, we had had one leader for 37 years. And if you ever visited Zimbabwe or if you're a Zimbabwean, everybody suspected everybody. Like you didn't know who was uh, part of the central intelligence, who was supported the political party, who did. People never expressed their polit political opinions. People lived in fear. Uh, fear of what may happen to you if you're seen to be anti-government or whatever. So to even discuss the issue of leadership would get you into trouble because the only leader was one. And we were all not supposed to have any ambitions, whether they are political, social, economic, whatever, but to put your, your name leader next to your name uh, would be very costly. And we all spent time trying to convince everybody that I'm not interested in being a leader. Leadership is not on my uh, uh, radar. But, you know, in 2017, we decided, you know what, let's face some brutal facts. So uh, we gathered a group of us and went away and began to really talk about uh, uh, what are the challenges that are holding us back? And what kind of leader do we want, are we, do we want to be? should we be raising? 
so it was a, a long process. And out of that, it became very clear that if you want to really talk about uh, uh, tackling the issue of leadership, it's not just leadership you need to tackle. It's a whole host of other issues you need to tackle. So first of all, we, we found it important to define where we want to be by a particular year. So we've locked into 2050. So we woke up one morning and realized it's not just politicians who are supposed to have a national vision, whether it's uh, uh, 10 years or 20 or 30 or 50. You and I can have a, a national vision. And, uh, and I would want to urge all of you, have a national vision for your nation, irrespective of whether you, whatever you want to do after you've graduated. We owe it to the African continent to do that. So when, you, when we did that, what we found is there were other documents that have, have already been done on vision, whether it's for Zimbabwe or for African continent. There's a, 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 an African vision 2063. So when we saw that, we said, well, ours is reasonable, 2050. We want Zimbabwe to be a middle-income country by 2050. Now, previously, we think it's politicians who are supposed to think like that. No, ordinary citizens should do that. It's part of what's, you know, how do we change our mindset? If we think it's only certain people who should be dreaming of what we can become. So when I look at a nation like Rwanda, it's not just President Kagame who buys into Rwanda being a, a you know, a high-income country or a first-world country. He's, it, it's the different individuals buy into the vision. To, it's not a political vision. It's a national vision that individuals buy into. So we saw that that is very critical. And how we intend to do it, we said we're going to set up uh, leadership academies, not schools, leadership academies, where we take uh, uh, kids who are, you know, between 16 and 18, spend a year and focus on those uh, critical components on leadership, which are peculiar to Zimbabwe and some of them are peculiar to Africa. So some of the things include, you know, as Zimbabweans we found we don't love our country. What do I mean by that? In, uh, you go around and ask, are you proudly Zimbabwean? It's only now that we are raising the flag high and, you know, coming and shouting I'm a Zimbabwean. Before, you know, it's like you apologize for your green passport, you apologize for a Zimbabwean, you apologize, wherever you are, it's, yeah, from Zimbabwe, yes, that hyperinflation country, mm -hmm. and, you know, <laughs> things like that. So we are developing a really uh, exceptional uh, uh, leadership program. I won't give you details now, but I would love to invite some of you to become mentors there. Uh, and we're going to do it big. Yeah. We do it in partnership with the government. What do I mean by partnership? We, the government is aware. We need them. We work together. But whoever is in offices, we work with. And we walk up to the reality of, if you have no intentions of being a politician, work with the leader who's in office. Because, you know, we, as Zimbabweans, we, we wait, we know we're waiting 37 years. I woke up one day, I was in my 50s, and I said, now I must wait for another leader. <laughs> and if I don't like him or her, that's another five years. If they're in office for another 10 years, I'll be in my late 60s. And then look back and say, I was waiting for the right leader to come. No. You, me, you, 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 we are the right leaders. Let's get on with the job. <laughs> Then on the issue of, of mentorship, I have to be honest with you, there is no one mentor who mentors anybody. It's a series of mentors. And mentors are not age related. It can be a young person, it can be somebody. It just depends which particular area you want addressed. So what I found myself, uh, 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 initially I was also looking for an all-rounded mentor who had everything. And then discovered that the best would be to identify different people that I speak to on different issues. So like my husband is my mentor. I'm also his mentor. We mentor each other for spe specific things. There's some issues I will never ask him because I know mm, it's, it's not his, uh, you know, there's a bit of a blind spot there. I won't share with you which areas I don't share with you. <laughs> so I found different people uh, and Sometimes also when you're in a uh, position like mine, you're a high-profile person or high-profile husband, wife of whatever. Uh, you know, people think your friends must also be wife of whatever. I've maintained my friends from way back. So some of my best friends are, if you saw them, you think, ah, is that one your closest friend? There are no names. 
ordinary, but boy, when I get into Harare, my staff know. In fact, one of my closest friends uh, works in higher life. She's a member of staff. She used to be senior, but we kind of like uh, gave, promoted her and put her somewhere where she's not as, she doesn't have too many responsibilities. But we are able to separate work and play. I, she's the kind of person I can put up my feet and be very much myself. And she's a good mentor for me. But if you ask Kennedy, who runs, uh, who is CEO of High Life, is she one of your best performers? You'll probably go, what? <laughs> but there's something that she does which helps me a lot, which uh, I see is uh, playing a mentorship role. So the long and short of it is find different people. And then also YouTube. Mentor YouTube. <laughs> you have to type in certain names or whatever, and TED Talks, all that is all part of men mentorship. Mentorship has to be very diverse, and it has to be, you know, uh, uh, different stages and also be peculiar to a particular need that you have or want to meet. Then funding from donors with strings attached. Long and short, I don't take money from donors. We use our own money. Because I don't want the vision diluted. And also, you know, I just think we have been so privileged and so blessed to be where we are. With all that we have, can we not sacrifice and sell shares to raise the money for what we need? Instead of now also writing a project proposal and lining up with somebody who doesn't have water, I feel embarrassed to do that. Okay. Uh, impact. How do we measure impact? There are various ways, tools that we have to use for impact. There isn't you know, one size fits all one or one approach. So it has to be project specific. Uh, uh, so the tools that we, because I belong to other networks as well, we always share information, knowledge. What are some of the tools? What, how, what's your, your impact uh, uh, matrix? What does it look like? And then you borrow some tools that others have, and then you apply, you add other things that are peculiar to what you're doing. I believe very much in uh, evidence-based research, but that it mustn't be the primary, your primary source of information. I believe data is important, your data analytics, so that you, you make informed decisions, but I also believe in gut. So it's a combination. Uh, at the end of the day, what's important for me is the human being. I am willing to put money into projects that don't make any sense at all, where there is zero return, and where also there is a possibility of failure. Because if we're just looking for success and for high impact and what have you, we miss a lot of important learnings or some very short-term projects that just need to live for a year or for two years. They don't need to exist forever. So uh, uh, flexibility is important and borrowing and learning uh, from what others have done and then trying to find thing, uh, tools that are also peculiar to your own model is also very important. So thank you so much. Thank you so much. I am personally delighted and honored to be here in this room and talking to you and listening to everything you have to say. So we are drastically out of time. And <laughs> I just want to say a big thank you to you and everyone who asked questions, everyone who listened. So please, everyone, can you join me and give her a round of applause as she walks to her seat? Thank you so much. Um, Mrs. Titimatiwa, um, the, the executive uh, the operations and uh, strategy for CMU, Rujije, Christo, and all the dignitaries here with us. It's an honor and privilege to be here this evening. Good evening to you all. Honesty is so difficult to speak after yourself because it inspired all of us and we didn't know even what time it was. <laughs> it was so inspiring and so motivational that everyone was listening very attentively. And thank you very much for speaking from your own heart. Um, as Rwanda, we are so delighted, especially the Rwandan young people and uh, other members from different institutions that are present from different nationalities. It's an honor really to listen from you, from your humble background and where you are right now. And you have really touched the lives of many young people. 250,000 young people is a big number. And also the target of 2 million 
leaders is also an awesome target. Can we give her a round of applause again? I also want to take this opportunity to thank Kano Gimelo University also for organizing this. I think they've been doing a lot of similar uh, invitations of speakers that have been speaking to our young people. Thank you very much for expanding the horizon and inviting other universities that have been participating in this. We really want to see more of, of this kind of uh, sessions because she mentioned that you don't have to have one mentor, you need a number of them. So this is part of the journey. Thank you very much, Kanog Meloni, for the great work. Uh, Mrs. Matsisiwa, when I was reading on your Twitter, trying to read much more and <laughs> not the other tweet, <laughs> um, I read and you said uh, uh, one of the four key things which are imperative and indispensable in leadership, there were five and one of them is invest in yourself. Young people, I think you need to invest in yourself. Why your parents, your government, everyone around you wants to see you progressing. but the number one promoter of yourself is yourself. So invest, invest, invest in yourself. The second was invest in your family. I think she said that. The people around you, how do you invest in them? How do you share what you have? The third was to invest in your profession. When you get a job, don't think that's the end of it. That's not the end of the road. You have to keep going because the challenges at your professional level is much more than the, the, the challenges that you had at the level when you're still a student. The fourth was invest in your community. That is the education that you are achieving or we are attaining today. The education is just a foundation to help you improve yourself and also improve your own community. While we were chatting before we came here with Carnegie Mellon University, they told us that uh, their students, they don't want to go abroad elsewhere. They want to study from African context that they can solve challenges within the African environment. That is awesome. That's the mindset shift completely, where everyone was running out of the continent. Now you want to stay in the continent so you can become a solution to the community. Thank you very much for that. <laughs> Last but not least, you remember the five? Yourself, your family, your profession, your community, and last but not least, your country. Thank you very much for talking about patriotism. Having a vision for your own country. It's not only for leaders to have the vision for the country, but each one of us need to have a vision for your own country, which is linked to the vision of the nation. That is very wonderful, and this is what we want to see in our young generation. Um, I can say much more about what you're doing and also appreciate the partnership that you have with the Mbuto Foundation. While you're talking, I could see the passion, and I know why you are linked to the Imbuto Foundation because you have the same cause. Thank you very much, Imbuto Foundation, for working with you on many <laughs> programs that are promoting young people. You're such a blessing to the continent, and I'm so delighted that you have a fellowship or a forum where you work together with similar like-minded people to promote our nation. Last, as I conclude, because I know time is not on our, time, on our side, um, no one has ever been poor by giving. Can someone show me by hand if you believe so? <laughs> it seems it's not something that you understand. I've never seen anyone being poor by giving. When you open up your hands to give, you open up for more blessing. But the more you hold it to yourself, you're closing the opportunities to get more. So I think you can go with that philosophy that by giving, you never be poor. And leadership is not, if you want clap, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> and honestly, leadership is not a position. Sometimes the young people wait for, wait when I become a mayor. Wait when I become a GTF. <laughs> wait when I become a head of this and that. Leadership is not position. It is your ability to influence in whatever environment you are at. You can influence your community, you can influence your school, you can influ influence your own family. So it doesn't matter where you are, leadership just emerges within you. So don't wait for the position to act. Don't wait for 50 years, don't wait for 30 years. Act now and the leadership is in you. I thank you very much for this great evening and I wish you a great evening. Thank you very much.